Hi, this is Bill Safer, and welcome to another episode of Hidden Treasures. Like I said, I'm Bill Safer, and I am the host of Hidden Treasures. And I welcome you, and on this show, we have a very special guest who is returning. But before we get to our guest, I'd like to do some customary shout-outs. Uh, we are at WCCA-TV in downtown Worcester, beautiful Worcester, and uh, we hope you have been enjoying these shows. Uh, I'd like to do some shout-outs or hellos to some of our viewers. Uh, it seems to be more and more every, every time, which is great. I want to say hello to Hani Fogelman. She's the co-director, along with Rabbi Mendel Fogelman, of Central Mass Shabbat at 22 Newton Ave in Worcester. They do a lot of things for the Jewish community, children's programs, adult programs, kosher cooking, and they even started a kosher takeout where anybody can go and get food ordered one day and picked up another day. And you don't have to be Jewish to like the food because it's really good. I'd like to say hello to the Maine South Community Center here in Worcester. They help out so many people who need food, clothes, medical care, and a whole lot of other things that these human angels give out. Their work is from the heart, and the leader is Ron Charette. She's the boss, and there is Chrissy Wheeler, Jose Valencia, Valencia, and Leslie Miranda, along with the great staff. They're always looking for donations of clothing, canned goods, and they're located on Camp Street, off of Cambridge Street, uh, and it's very easy to find. It's right next to St. John Cemetery, and they're not going anywhere soon, so it's a good landmark. Uh, I'd like to say hello to Joanne Salo and Brennan Salo. Joanne Salo won uh, the Millbury Sutton Chronicles Reader's Choice Award for the Best Consignment Shop, Millbury Town Consignment. And Brennan Salo, her son, won the Millbury Chronicles, uh, Sutton Chronicles Reader's Choice Award for the Best Carpenter, Salo Construction Company. Hello to my friend Judy Zarr. Manager of Costume World in Southern Florida, one of the finest costume shops on the East Coast, if not the country. Uh, thanks, Judy. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to say hi to Kara, John, Evie, and Lily of Alpine Farms in Fitchburg, a beautiful hobby farm with horses, chickens, turkey, one male turkey named Jelly, who's a star. He goes around to all the schools and, and makes appearances. I've known Kara for a long time, a very sweet person, along with her husband, John, a great guy as well. Evie and Lily, their young children, are the cutest blonde girls I had ever seen, and I'm trying to convince them to get them on TV. Okay, I would, it's an honor to introduce my very special guest, who is now a veteran of the show, uh, and he owns his own auction business, and we're going to learn a lot today about the auctions. And I'd like to introduce you to, once again, Wayne Tuscola. Wayne, thank you for coming. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you, thank you. Um, Wayne, what is the, um, before we start out, well, we are starting out, but I want people to always know how you can be reached, your business and everything. So what is the name of your business? It's Central Mass Auctions. Okay, and uh, where is it located? Uh, we're, we have an office on uh, Park Ave, but, uh, and also an office in Boston now, but I'm typically on the road uh, usually. Uh, so it's best to reach me by phone or email and set up an appointment. I, I'm typic I typically do uh, on-site visits. Okay, could you give our viewers phone numbers and email? Sure. Uh, 508-612-6111 is the phone number. Okay. Uh, the website is centralmassauctions.com, and the email is info at centralmassauctions.com. Okay. Uh, do you have a Facebook page or website? I, I do. Uh, the, the website is uh, centralmassauctions.com, and the Facebook page is uh, facebook.com forward slash centralmassauctions. And, and also uh, the, another one for Boston, Boston uh, facebook.com forward slash Boston Central Mass Auctions. Oh, excellent. And now what's your blood type? No, we don't <laughs> need that. Um, now, I've heard of your auctions, and I see some of the previews, and you really have some beautiful things. Uh, could you tell us about how often you have auctions? Y yeah, I try to, uh, I run, uh, an irregular schedule. It might be every three to four months uh, because I'm looking for things that are going to draw people from a f uh, further distance outside the, not only people from Worcester, but um, people who may drive from Boston or Hartford or Providence. So uh, uh, we, we typically go three to four months and it's not a set schedule. The uh, next one will be January 26th. Okay. Uh, now, 
Do you travel? You mentioned you're on the road. Yes. So you will travel to someone's home to look at potential auction items? I exactly. In fact, um, we, I brought some things I know you want me to show uh, the audience later, and um, I can tell you where some of the things came from, but they're from towns um, all uh, throughout Massachusetts. I get a lot of business from Northeast Connecticut, and I've traveled even fur further for items. So that's good to know, because uh, you know some places don't. You have to bring the thing to them. And it's kind of hard if you have a giant Greek statue made out of marble. Um, now, you have brought some items, and before we get to learn more about the actual auction process, um, I'd like you to get a chance to show your items, please, and explain them. Okay, sure. We'll um, start off with some of the things that uh, our auctioneer always likes to get. Uh, of course, uh, gold and silver is uh, big. And uh, this is the first item is a gold uh, coin. It's a two and a half dollar gold coin, and it's also uh, on a jewel. The chain itself is actually 14k. And um, sometimes people, I'll get asked by people, is it uh, good if they make it into jewelry? And it really depends if it's been soldered or if they drill a hole in it. Uh, that's not always the best thing. It, uh, some of the numismatic uh, collectible value is is gone, but. Um, but, but this one is in a frame, it, basically, it, so it, it, the value is the same. It, it, exactly, yeah. right. So so that still will still hold its value, and it's actually a little more value, a little bit, uh, because it's uh, you've got the chain with it, so. These are v extremely valuable. I know they, this is two and a half dollars. Yes. Said, I know they have them in even a dollar. Right. Increments, yeah. and the small ones, believe it or not, are rarer sometimes than the big ones. Yeah. And thank you, Wayne, for paying me for the show. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, here you go. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, sure. Gold pieces will, are always hot. Gold, always hot. Yeah. Gold, gold pieces, auctioneers also like to get silver. Oh, right? yes. So these are um, some silver dollars here. And, and um, Okay. Well, you have, I think, yeah. there's but, some... Uh, Three of them, I believe, are Morgan, and right. one is the Seated Liberty? Correct. Yeah. And one of the things I mentioned about it's not good if they were made into jewelry, and the Seated Liberty does have a hole in it, um, which it affects the value a little bit. And, but um, I, I was reading a little uh, to try to find out why they did those holes, and there's people uh, may have made jewelry with them. There are all different reasons. Some people may have just wanted to see if they could do them. Someone uh, suggested that maybe they were tacked up on the masthead for good luck. And so, but uh, it does uh, decrease the value, but that's still an older and rarer coin. Oh, still. So still I mean, value. you, you don't see value. that many. many. And as a matter of fact, um, I know you've heard of the uh, United States trade dollar. Yes. A lot of those were actually cut in half, hollowed out, and there's a secret door in them you get to by pressing the edge of the coin for opium. Oh. Uh, they call them opium coins. And uh, a lot of them have, have been discovered innocently while someone was going through a coin collection. Hmm. These are beautiful. And uh, these are, I believe, what is it? Almost pure silver, right? Y yeah, yeah. Uh, 90%. 90%. And, of course, they're, they're not in circulation anymore, and they don't even have silver in circulation. Right. So... You have to buy them at an auction, a coin store, uh, or from the mint. They have special editions of proof sets and things that will have a silver coin, and they sell silver commemoratives. But uh, believe it or not, I still find every once, once a year, I find one in change wow. that's just been rattling around. Wow. Last one was a buffalo nickel, 1913, I think. Well, that's good luck. Yeah. They, they, good luck to find them. I don't typically run into them in change too often. Then, uh, besides gold and silver, collectibles are still the market's still pretty strong, and I have a number of baseball cards here that I brought along. The, these are um, from the '50s. One, my, my uh, Mickey Mantle. Wow. Mickey, Mickey, Mickey Mantle. My my uh, uh, middle school teacher uh, decided he wanted to sell a collection that he and his brothers had. So uh, I have them starting in the f uh, early 1950s, going into the 1960s. Um, there's Willie Mays. Willie Mays. Uh, these are really treasures. They, they are, and conditions are uh, really important. And these are uh, most of these are in pretty uh, pretty good good condition. Boston's own Kali Yastrzemski. Uh, yes, it's a rookie card. A rookie card. That's even more valuable. Uh, yes. These are beautiful, and um, there's a beautiful Mickey Mantle. I mean, the condition of these are fantastic. 
Yeah, a lot of times uh, they ended up on bicycle spokes uh, or a traded, flipped, and but these, uh, were, most of these are in pretty pretty good condition. You don't know how many people you've probably heard this yourself. Everybody had baseball cards and they got thrown out, or the mother threw them out, or the father threw them out. But I knew a guy who had baseball cards from the 20s and 30s. And when he got divorced, the first thing his wife did was throw him in the dumpster. Uh, uh, 20s and 30s. Uh, I, I hate to hear things like yeah, that. Yeah, me too. But, I'm, but a lot of people, I know a guy that has all of them from his childhood, from 40, 50 years old. You know, so these are beautiful. And I, I know you can buy these covers, these protective covers at places like Lincoln Stamp and Coin right. in Worcester and other places. Yes, yeah. And that's it, it. It's worthwhile to protect them because yeah. your skin oil will eventually get on them. Yeah, if you have some better ones like these, uh, you definitely would want to consider that. Uh, the Callius Tremsey rookie card, as an example, what would something like that be expected to sell for? Uh, condition is everything with those because um, for uh, like the, the mantle we were looking at the last one, I, I've seen them go for six figures, but uh, wow. but that, a gra that's at a grade 10. And so if you've got a grade four, it's, uh, we, we've sold one before, a uh, similar one that was maybe about 1,500 because um, the grade will, uh, condition makes a huge difference. Like comic books. Ex exactly. Big difference. Right. Well, I think it was a couple of summers ago that they were fixing up a house and they found an old baseball card collection and they had... I think it was two Honus Wagners in mint condition. Yes. And they sold for big money. Yeah. Yeah, that could, uh, Wayne Gretzky owned uh, one of the fam most famous Honus Wagner cards that's sold for into the millions. Wow. So you never know what's out there, what you're going to find. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and um, this is from, uh, I should have mentioned the, uh, where the, some of these things came from. I said I was going to uh, do that. The coins were from a Leicester estate, uh, and, um, and this is actually from a doctor's estate Beautiful. in Worcester. And, and that's a, a book, um, if we just open up the inside page, uh, you'll see that it's uh, set from 1793 on the title page. Wow. There's a map in there, uh, Oops, kind of, that. but that's, um, what, uh, it's a Worcester County, um, uh, book, it's a Worcester County history book. And, and you and see the beautiful uh, marbling. marbling in the book plate. And you said there's a date. In the there there is, yeah. That's the map. So Could we you were, find that? Yeah, let me pull, yeah. It, pull it out here. I have never handled many books from the 1700s. Uh, here it is right there. So John uh, Adams. Yeah, it was... Uh, in 1793, the uh, person who wrote the book dedicated it to John Adams, who was the vice president at the time. But um, all, another interesting thing about it is it was published by um, Isaiah Thomas, who from who another was, famous he, person, yeah, a famous person here in Worcester, and uh, he did the Worcester, Worcester County uh, history book. So this book is in remarkable condition for its age. It, it, it is in very nice shape. It, this is from a doctor's estate in Worcester. That we're handling it. Had an autograph collection. He collected some rare books, and that's going to be part of the January sale. Beautiful. I mean, example of the bookmaker's art with the with the marbling and things it, like it, that. It is. Yeah. Man. What's the what's that about that particular book? Oh, it's a history of yeah, uh, history of, of Worcester County. So it's got all the uh, towns and it's got Worcester, of course. But then, um, uh, uh, if you want to show yeah. that history of Worcester County. So, so it's got information on yeah. you know, the history and from the, as much history as we had back in 1793. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is that you could see what was going on back it, then. It, yeah, it, 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 true. And uh, here's another thing I brought along. This is from a... Did you kill a pirate before you got this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's it's a, a child's uh, don't, don't top uh, trunk, and so actually for doll clothes. And, and, but uh, the thing that is it, kind of interesting is we have all the compartments here that this pulls out. And, and um, there's also... Uh, the doll Victorian clothes. Cl big doll, doll clothes in there. And, and I know your show is called Hidden Treasures. And yes. This actually was a hidden treasure. We didn't find that when we were first in the estate. It was buried underneath the bed and Harvard. Oh, that is a hidden treasure. <laughs> and, and, and the workmanship on these things are absolutely beautiful. It, it's got the little boxes with uh, 
covers on them. Was this built as a doll chest specifically? Yes, it, it was a doll chest, um, you know, possibly a salesman sample. Uh, it, 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 may, it may have been, but I must presuming it to be a doll's uh, chest. But in the date about uh, uh, that's uh, late 1800s. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. I know that um, uh, that some of the doll chests and some of the clothes can go for really big money especially Victorian and, and miniatures that go with the dollhouse and beautiful. Exactly. And the other thing that it was kind of interesting is it's uh, made by Barnard Trunks here in Worcester. Uh, it has a label. They were on um, 310 Main Street, and I looked it up on the web, and it looks like they moved a little further down than the 400 block later on. I wonder if that's connected with Barnard's clothing shop, it, it, maybe it, a relative or it, something. It, yeah. it, it may have had some connection. I think it's a lot of fun to have things from here because you know you, things are beautiful from portland oregon and, and washington but when you have something here it hits home because it's your history you know it's our history exactly and there are local collectors who are looking for, for those type of things you know, like worcester history i, I collect um, postcards myself and other things from I, I do my, i do too yeah. yeah it's funny i find i find a lot of them in maine Oh, okay. uh, but not the re I won't, you know, everybody's reproducing them now. Right. So I won't buy the repros. Yeah. It's like I said, I can say I have a Mona Lisa in my living room, but it's a repro. So it looks the same, but it's not valued the same. Uh, do you have any other? Oh, yeah, this we've is... got uh, one last thing. Okay. I think we're going to end up blocking your blocking That's you okay. out of the shot here. They well, can but, see me in the paper. But uh, <laughs> uh, maybe a little lower. I can see his head, get his head too. I can drop it down on the floor okay. if you want. Let's see. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, uh, so that's um, a wooden die cut. Advertising is another thing that always sells well at auction, and we've got a die cut from Duke's uh, Rolling Tobacco here, and uh, with the cowboy, it's got graphics are great on it. Someone wow, that's preserved beautiful. it and put it into this frame. And, so. and how old? Which is 1800s? Um, this one uh, a little newer. I think uh, we're in the 20th century, um, maybe. Um, 20s, 30s era uh, on that. Um, they made some older ones, this company from the 1800s. A lot of those are enamel, but, but uh, I think this one. I mean, this is beautiful because it's double collectible because they don't allow that anymore. Right. No tobacco ads. Now, yeah, that's that's true, and um, has the cowboy uh, is of interest to people. So, it, well, Duke, that's the name John Wayne it, took. It, it, you wonder if he saw this and said, "Duke, that's a good nickname." It, it, you know, it, it, it could, could be. <laughs> okay, uh, now auctions, uh, Wayne, as, as, of course, you know better than anyone, are not seasonal, like some things are. So you can enjoy and attend an auction all year. Is that that's correct? Uh, th th that's correct. Uh, in fact. Um, you know, we have one in January 26, but um, we have the hall uh, scheduled an extra day just in case of snow. Of I mean, course, it, it, that's it, the it, only worry. It, it, right. And I have seen them canceled because no one's going to come from Hartford in the blizzard. You know, and it does happen. It it it, it does happen, but it, but we find that uh, we get some of the best crowds and some of the best bidding happens uh, during the winter. You know, so. you're right. I've been I've been to an auction during a storm, and it was as packed as it was in the summer. You, because as long as they're not saying, you know, ice and dangerous, right. people will come. That's true. Yeah. Uh, now, I like to ask people, especially auctioneers, uh, do you have any surprises you could tell us about? Uh, what I mean by that is something that was supposed to go for an average, ordinary price that went to the roof for one reason or another? Uh, yeah, we, we had... Um one time I uh, had some pennies, and they were 1924, not a particularly rare date. It was a little over a roll of uh, Lincoln pennies. And uh, I had um, some people who were coin um, experts look at them and figured them for maybe two to 4000 which I thought was, was great. But uh, when they went at auction, they ended up bringing in uh, about close to well over 10, like wow. 11,000 range be because they were just so well preserved. They looked like they had been minted the day before, so the condition made it all the difference. Oh, that's beautiful. I know that um, with coins, I mean, with coins and auctions, what I love about it is they can say the retail value of this roll of coins is a thousand, but that doesn't mean it's not going to go for higher because unlike other venues, auctions let people fight over items using money as the weapon. Right. So, 
you think could be worth a thousand, but it could sell for six, seven, eight, ten, and up because two collectors want it. That, that, yeah. That's true. We, we, another uh, thing we had one time was a uh, had a little penny uh, gum dispenser, and I had a clown in it, and it went on a wall. And I picked that up in Cleveland, um, and, a, and a person had set up a house that looked like a country store in his home, and I had a person who called me say he was uh, said he was a collector and he uh, put a $700 bid which he thought was reasonable and at the time was uh, you know but sounded reasonable to me but there were just two people who wanted it at auction and it ended up bringing 7,000 so, wow so that was another surprise yeah, I know I talked to a uh, my former orthodontist and he retired he taught at Harvard Dental School for a while and now he does auctions and flea markets and it, it, you've probably experienced this where the f wife or the family member is not an antique person. So I remember he went to a yard sale and bought this fitted wooden case. And when he got it home and he showed his wife, she said, what did you get that for? How much did you pay for that? And he said, 700. 700? Oh my God, what is it? And he said, it's a Civil War surgeon's field kit. Mm -hmm. And the handles were in ivory. It had the bone saws for the amputations and all that. Well, I ended up putting it in an auction in Boston, and I think it brought eight to 10,000, as I remember. I don't remember the exact amount. So his wife didn't say anything <laughs> after that uh, because he proved himself. And it's right. funny, he used to be a big Heise glass collector and make all kinds of money, he told me, but the Heise glass market just dropped out like the silver plate and yes. a lot of the china. Right, yeah. glass um, and china I've seen really tumble. Yeah. Uh, how do you get, uh, could you explain to the viewers, please, um, the process of you getting paid and them getting paid? Uh, okay, um, so uh, I'll, typically I'll get a call from someone and we, I do a little bit of vetting on the phone just to see if um, it is something that would be a good fit for our auctions where we are running uh, three to four months. And we look, we're a little bit more selective right. than uh, others may be. So then I may also have them send me pictures and once they decide to do that, uh, then um, we, we uh, have a consignment fee, which uh, does vary. If um, we, we got to get a truck and pick up some bigger things, it's going to be a little, high, in, yeah. Yeah, a little higher than maybe uh, some of the, the gold jewelry we just showed and some things that I can put in my pocket uh, when I'm trans to transport. And, and the, um, we also get a fee for a buyer's premium, uh, which the buyer pays an additional fee. But a lot of that we find goes to our expenses. We promote the auction well. I've got staff I hire. And uh, so a lot of uh, good percentage of that does uh, get eaten up. Well, I know there's a lot of expenses involved. But of course, the auction company has to be paid as well. And, that's, and it's a very fair arrangement. Uh, where you see this thing blow up to all proportions is Christie's and Sotheby's when they get a Van Gogh or Gauguin and it sells for 16 million and they get 20 or 30 percent of that, you can see why they're very well off. Right, right. Most people don't have the chance to do that, but uh, once in a while it happens that a painting comes through that's uh, more than they thought, you know. Right. Um, could you give our viewers some tips or hints on potentially recognizing something of value for an auction? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, but one, of, one of the things that we uh, do pretty well with and see a lot of is artwork. So there, there's some things you can do on your own. Um, you can get a loop out and find out if it's a, the thing that you're looking at is actually a painting because that's one of the calls I get the most. If people have a print and, uh, uh, yeah. and I'll hear uh, it says uh, Renoir on it. And I'd say, you might want to take a closer look at that because it's you see a lot of dots. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. right. So, so uh, they, uh, they, that's some of the th one thing you can do. Then if you find out it actually is a painting, you look and you can see br brush strokes. Um, you, can, you can go uh, online, you can get books. I have da Davenport's Art Reference Guide and you can look up the uh, artists and, or you can go to different websites. Some charge you to be able to do the research, but you can get an idea of um, what that artist sells for and you can do some of the work on your own. Now, is, would it be not a good thing to take it to the art museum? Or are they receptive to something like that? You know, I don't think the art museum uh, 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 here does that uh, much. I actually uh, talked with somebody a while ago, and um, uh, they suggested if you ever needed an appraiser, they have no people who do that. But um, yeah, uh, 
they're they're probably not your best uh, resource for, uh, for for that type of thing. Okay, thank you. I, you know that's uh, that's interesting. Now, uh, do you and when you're doing an auction, do you do reserves? And what I mean by that is, a person might say to you, "I don't want this to start any less than fifteen hundred dollars." Do you do reserves? You know, very at uh, atypically. I, I when I was. Um, on the road show, and I got um, Elliot Ness's credentials. That's the antiques yeah, road show. We yes. we uh, uh, put a reserve on that, and but but typically we'll, we uh, we don't. I've had um, a painting I picked up in a Lexington home, bring in the twenty twenties of thousands, and we you know we knew we knew uh, the buyers were going to be there. If it's well promoted, the prices are going to uh, you're going to get fair market value so for it. No, and sometimes uh, people, believe it or not, as you know, get turned off by a. a um, a set price to start, but they're the ones that end up paying seven thousand, and they're mad that it started out at fifteen hundred. You know, <laughs> that, 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 that's true, and and I think that uh, buyers um, will keep coming to your auction if they know it's a fair auction and that you don't have reserves on everything, and that they're able to actually buy things. Well, sure, their reputation is the most important thing, is from your past experiences. Okay, well, we're getting to the end of the show and when you're on it always goes by extremely quickly um, for one final thing I would like to ask you uh, do you think that there are still treasures to be found in this 21st century I, I do I, I even though um, we've got all the wealth of information on the internet and we uh, got a TV shows like the antiques road show where people can see things there are some uh, some people who um, uh, still don't know what they have or or they may live in another state and they just want the thing sold and there's always a opportunity always out a there possibility for, exactly well Wayne I'd like to thank you well, thank for you. coming it's always a pleasure. Uh, you'll probably be here again. Uh, th th thank you, Bill. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this is Bill Safer, uh, for your host of Hidden Treasures, WCCA-TV. Uh, if you like this program or a nonprofit charitable organization, you might consider a donation. Um, I'd like to thank Frank Rocco, uh, the director of all these shows. I think this is like 48 or 49. And thank him for his hard work in directing and engineering. And remember, even in the winter, I don't know when this is because this show is seasonless, but go out and find a treasure or two. <laughs>